Hello and welcome. Thank you for listening to Interview with DJ Malterna. I'm speaking with English music journalist, author, and founding member of the Membranes, John Robb. Hi, John. Hi, are you okay? Yeah, 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 I can hear you pretty good. You're all up there in Manchester. Thank you so much for joining me, and um, I'm really excited to talk about your, your, you have a new book that's coming out. It's called The Art yes. of Darkness, The History of Goth, and it's expected to be released sometime in, you say March? That be was that the expected date? Yeah, it's gonna be out the end of March. It's on pre-order now, but out proper end of March. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it certainly is um um a wonderful book. I so I've, I've been reading it, and uh, it certainly does cover the Encyclopedia of the Dark. You know, there's so much material in there. People would just have to get the book if they really want to find an artist they want to know about. Better than going to Google, check out your book. Yeah, I thought. With, with with goth especially like all kind of music cultures it, it gets kind of condensed into a very small narrative doesn't it so when I've done a few interviews today with people who don't really know what it is and they think it's all black lipstick and black hair which it is to a certain extent there's a lot more to it that's just a tip of a very big dark iceberg so um, so I thought initially I, I was sort of unpack all the music and the culture but as you keep unpacking it goes further and further so the book itself will start with the fall of Rome and end with Instagram influences, which I thought was quite interesting, actually, because I think I got, what was interesting to me was that every generation has a way of dealing with its blues, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, a romantic poet or a painter or somebody on Instagram putting a picture up standing in a sort of uh, misty forest dressing golf clothes with no music in it at all. And it's not like that post-punk period was the only period where people embrace that kind of narrative you know it's been there for, for centuries hasn't it and so, so the book kind of unpicks at that but also threads it all together so in a sense the argument is every generation is dealing with blues but also someone like Lord Byron in his time is the equivalent of a Nick Cage figure in our time who's the equivalent of an Instagram influencer now you know they're not they're not any higher or lower art they're just different ways of dealing with the same kind of feelings so you know the title, "The Art of Darkness." Um, why did you come up with that title? Why Why did you choose that title? Well, I mean, obviously, it's like a pun on the heart of darkness, which is such a great book, and also because the heart of darkness is a book that Apocalypse Now is based on as well. And Apocalypse Now is a very important film in the goth narrative, you know, because in, in the UK, especially, uh, the, the Apocalypse Now brought the Doors into the mainstream because before 1980, the Doors were a big cold band, but they weren't. You know, their albums didn't really chart here, but after the after the Apocalypse Now, they became a really important band and also very influential in the They are the first goth band, arguably. Um, so that kind of Paris tone style of singing and everything infused the uh, kind of post-punk generation. So we, we had a sort of latent doors effect because of Apocalypse Now, which leads us back to the book. So it's a pun on the book. And I like the idea there is an art to the darkness because I think of... Oh, yeah. A lot of mainstream sort of uh, media people, they sort of look down on, on Groff a bit, you know, like it's, uh, it's like a trashy culture, not realising some of the best art rock that was ever created was created in so-called Groff music. I mean, all the bands aren't all hate the term Groff, so, uh, so we'll put that in now. <laughs> I just have to explain it over and over. But about like Bauhaus make incredible records, some of the best art rock records ever created in the UK. I mean, every single song they write is completely different. It sounds mm -hmm. like Bauhaus, but they don't really get the credit for it. You know, when you see, uh, when you read an article on, you know, groundbreaking music in the post punk period, they don't get a mention, which is ridiculous. So I'm here to fight their corner. I'm sure they're not that bothered, but uh, <laughs> it just needs stating that they were as artful as any of the bands to get all the plaudits and, and, and all the other bands in that period as well. You know, um, when do you think the word goth actually came into the picture? Because, you know, for me, growing up in Hawaii, you know, um, it wasn't called goth. It was called death rock back in the in the in the early in the late eighties. It was called death rock over here. Yeah, we're, and and you know, we're death, yeah. you know, in we're your death, death, yeah. oh sorry, <laughs> I, I, was just, I was just gonna say in your book you mentioned Martin Hannett even said Joy Divisions are dancing music with gothic overtones. You know. Yeah. Well, it actually goes back further than that. The first Doors gig in New York City, nineteen sixty-seven. The reviewer said they had a gothic overtones to their music. So it was the earliest reference I could find to a piece of music or a band being called goth or gothic was well, the door. So it's very fitting, really. I mean, there is dark music before that, of course. You've got 
you know, uh, Rolling Stones painted black, or the original Death Rock, which is all those kind of very dark ballads in the late 50s, or Shangri La's were called Death Rock, you know, uh, because, you know, the, all those kind of great girl group songs about a boyfriend dying in a motorbike crash was original Death Rock. But it's, it was Christian Death who, who put that into the context of the music that we're talking about when uh, Ros Williams called what they were doing Death Rock. So in the UK, we never called it Death Rock. So it'd be a term that we didn't, we didn't, I don't think most people here have even heard that term for about 10 years afterwards. But even the initial goth scene itself in the UK was not called goth. It was called alternative music or post-punk. So it was, uh, it was goth was a retrospective term put onto the scene about two years after it was actually a, a, a definable scene. I mean, there's obviously a scene there. There's people kind of grown out of punk people's hair was getting longer, the looks were getting freakier. There's a darker kind of vibe about you know, story, sartorially and musically, but it wasn't called goth initially. Then it got called goth um, in about 1980-81 as, as almost like a, a sneery sort of put down. So all the bands instantly hated the term. So you wouldn't find it, you know, people like Andrew Eldridge have spent 40 years completely denying the existence of goth, you know, even though they are, for many, many people into goth culture in the world, they're one of the staples of that culture, which I think is fair enough. I don't see... I mean, no, no legitimate band would ever want to be uh, stuck in a scene where people tell people outside the band telling them what they're meant to do, you know, what they're meant to sound like. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but at the same time, they don't complain about the audience turning up. <laughs> but there's, a def- there's definitely a very discernible goth culture played out in small clubs and weird towns. And that's the other thing that I was really went into a lot in the book. That, that a lot of um, the goth culture wasn't driven by London, even though the back caves in London. So it was, it was a place you would expect. So the first golf club was actually in Leeds, the yeah, uh, yeah. Fono, which was about two or three years before the Batcave. But it, didn't, it, wasn't on, it, it wasn't on TV. The Batcave was on television programs, documentaries. But the Fono, because at that time in Leeds, there was no media. So nobody covered things, you know. They, but then it kind of went out from beyond place like Leeds to place like Keithley or Wakefield, which are broken mill towns where nothing ever happened, you know. But suddenly you've got this really incredibly exotic culture existing in really weird towns. So, so I start the book, the first, the first proper chapter of the book is a night out at a British golf club in about, you know, I, I kind of blur the years, but it's 79 to 82. So the soundtrack isn't scientifically accurate. But I like the idea of the golf couple walking through the street, going to the club and, and how, how dangerous that was at the time. You would get beaten up for looking like that, you know, and how people used to wear big coats to hide the clothes, you know, so yeah, you yeah. couldn't see <laughs> Yeah. I remember those times. It was it was hairy getting from like from your house to uh, the club. <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny because um in, in your book you you mentioned about Robert Smith saying he's not goth. He, he, his band was a raincoat band. Yeah, well that was actually a scene that was got, that was like Jordan Vision and um, and the Cure to a certain extent. Bands that wore big raincoats because uh, Ian Curtis used to wear that big green Mac. And Adam Mann actually wore one as well. The like nineteen forties Macs weren't there. No, it's a great look. It's a good style. But they were called raincoat bands because because um, it rained a lot and it was a bit miserable, which, which kind of, it's, it's almost like a description of goth, isn't it? The thing about The Cure was they were going before goth, you know, because they started in 1976. Oh, yeah. They started as, as an arty punk band, so their first album is closer to Wire or, or even XDC, that kind of arty kind mm. of sort of, it's not quite post-punk, but it doesn't really fit in anywhere. And John Peel will play a lot, so... It'd be very, very solemn looking young men who were into Joy Division and, and kind of arty post punk would go to Cure gigs. Then they did two albums when it got darker, more minimalist, which actually now would sound like goth albums. But when they do pornography, they, they, and after he'd been in the Banshees, he gets a look from the Banshees, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but pornography is actually one of the pillars of goth. It's one of the great oh, goth. Yeah, yeah. One of the best albums. That's one of my favorite. That's my favorite album by The Cure, I think. Oh, it's awesome. I, mean, I think anybody who's. Uh, uh, a genuine, you know, found the cure way through. That's the one, and it's a hardcore right. fans one. I saw him on that tour a couple of times. And oh yeah, yeah. The, the, the gigs are amazing. I love. I've, I've been going to see the Cure since the first album. You know, and to this day, they're fantastic. You go and see them live now. Oh yeah, you know they. I'll be better. Yeah. They they've been here to Hawaii twice. On the on both nights, they played three days, and the one of the biggest concert venues here sold out. And then, all worldwide, yeah. yeah. It's like somebody, somebody today was saying, does this culture exist anymore? It's going, it's bigger now than it ever was. I mean, I was at the Cure with about 200 people when I first went to see them, but now they play stadiums, you know, worldwide. I mean, they're huge in America. In a weird way, 
in yeah. America, they were, they were the first band that the first people's experience of prop band was a cure because you got. I'm not talking about people who are new, not underground people, but mainstream terms, because they had a number two album in America. They were bigger in America than they were here, and they, they really opened the door for, for a lot of um, kind of mal kids into this whole other culture, you know. So, I mean, I think it's totally understandable that Robert Smith doesn't consider himself a god. But if you look at it in terms of culture terms outside the band, their impact on the goth scene has been enormous, like musically, but also opening up the scene into the mainstream as well. Yep, definitely. You know, another successful artist uh, is Nick Cave. It's quite iconic. Is similar to the uh, to the Cure, where he he can draw just a big crowd to his to his events and performances. He's not he's not only a musician, he's a filmmaker, and uh, so many other poets and so many other things. So I guess he expands his. Uh, of course, big fan of Nick Cave. <laughs> yeah. And I, and and I think one of the one of the key to his success is a Virgo. He's very determined and focused. On what he can do, what he does, and I know you yeah. you, you do cover the uh, different artists in your book. Uh, you did talk about a little bit about them in each um chapter. Yeah, he's, well, he, again, he's another one who would never say he was goth, but he definitely came out of that scene. You know, I mean, they definitely darkened up their music to make it more intense. When you listen to the Boys Next Door stuff and his very early stuff, it's kind of weird listening now. It's almost like pop punk, some of it, and it's uh. He yeah, has quite a different voice, to me. And I think they were trying to go for a punky rocks and music thing. That's what they were trying to do at the time. But when they came to England, because it's because at that time when they arrived in England, the culture, the underground was getting more intense and dark. But also, England was a pretty nappy place. It was if you're quite a sensitive person, the way the country was so broken would actually sort of in and, and and the weather, which it could be in Australia, it took a bit getting used to. Yeah. <laughs> And within about two months, they, they, they were much heavier. And also released The Bats, which is a great song. Oh, they yeah. wrote that for The Batcave, didn't they? I mean, he'll deny it now. But that was a song written for the dance floor of The Batcave. And it's a fantastic song. The production's great on it. Nick Rainey, one of the great, greatest producers of drum sounds, does a fantastic job on the drums on that. And, and to this day, if you go into a golf club and play a bit of trad golf, which we call it now, which I love that term, uh, well, you'll hear that song with them, you know. So... I mean, he's always been very smart, Nick. You know, he's always seen where to position the band, you know. To, so that time, they, they arrived in England's kind of weird art rock band from Australia. But there was definitely a space for them in the more intense underground. And they navigated themselves towards that. But also, they, they completely scapulated it and defined it within about six months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and by the time they get to, by time, sorry, by the time they get to the second birthday party album, it's, a, it's an amazing record, isn't it? It's so heavy. And those two 12 inches after that, to me, another peak, like the long three years. I mean, if, if only they made a third album, it would be enormous. I mean, huge sounding, dark and intense, also very colourful and day glow and poetic as well. Like those, that's two 12 inches are. Mm -hmm. I know, yeah. And, and, and I love how you mentioned, like, um, you know, Roland Howard in, in your book as well. And uh, I think that's one of my, he's one of my favorites from, uh, from the Nick Cave family. Um, you know, and, then, and you, you know that song he did with uh, the cover he covered yeah, with it's... Lydia Lunch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's super dark. Some Velvet Morning. It's, <laughs> isn't that so fantastic? Yeah. It's, uh, the, I mean, the sound in it was great. I mean, he's really going somewhere that sound. But also the vocal delivery, that sneer in his voice when he goes, when I'm straight. And the way he sings it, it's really oh, great. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. takes I mean, it, the darkness. It, <laughs> yeah, it's totally it's, beautiful. It, it's, he was supremely talented, Roland. And I, I think it's sad that, you know, that the drugs got in the way of, uh, yeah. at that time to... Because I think if you he, if he, if he had the work ethic that Nick Cave had, and Nick, Nick Cave obviously had a pretty crazy lifestyle at the time, but he always maintained his work ethic. I think Roland Howard was so intermittent, you could never find him, could you? He was doing one project and another. They would I disappear know. for two years and pop up somewhere else. And it was hard to keep track of where he was, you know. And if he made a series of records... Not sounding the same as some Velvet Morning, but with that kind of um, that big production, that clarity to it, I think he, he could have been very much an equal of Nick Cage. You know, he was at that point in time, the birthday party, they, they were both equally talented in that group, weren't they? Which is why it had to stop, you know, you can't have two very talented, very productive alpha males in one band. It just never works, does it? <laughs> do, do you think with the rise of uh, darker films, you know, through the years with the film Burton films and and um, you know Frankenstein and now with the new Netflix um, series you know Ad Wednesday Adams about the macabre family do you think 
Do you think it will ever? Do you think the golf subculture will will be will be more embraced now with? Um, oh, yeah, completely. But it, it already is in a way. I mean, those films are just part of, yeah. of where you find it in the mainstream. Don't you? I mean, obviously, we talk about a minute ago about those groups playing stadiums, but also initially, I'll talk about the Instagram influencers who have like half a million followers just putting up pictures of themselves looking yeah. very gothic. But it's not it's not related to the music. It's just a style, which is fair enough, isn't it? Because in yeah. a way, Wednesday Islands is 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 very much about the styling of it. But now, like people, my friends of mine say, "Oh, my my kids are doing the Wednesday dance," you know. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it, but it's everywhere. It's kind of like all those kind of cultures that appear that, that years later they're everywhere and nowhere, aren't they? So if you walk down the street, you won't see anybody who discernibly looks incredibly gothic. But then you go into a bar, or the other night, I don't really watch much telly, but I was on my mum, and they had this kind of really mainstream cop TV series of which everybody watches and they had uh, a Joy Division demo as part of the soundtrack of it a really obscure track I was going this is insane and then, I never even heard this on the radio in my life let alone on, on the mainstream TV it was, like, it, it was like that bit where they were just going from Warsaw to Joy Division like one of the demos and things and it was like wow you know because there are probably people like me who are in positions in TV now just sneaking this stuff in so it's, it's kind of threaded into the mainstream now without anybody noticing. But then you go to a gig and everybody's there and you think, where have all these people been in the last 20 years? I mean, the block of flats I live in Manchester, there's three goths in that block of flats, but I never see them. <laughs> I think they just stay in all the time. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think um, if, you're, if, you, if you're a goth, do you think you'll always be goth deep in your heart? I think, but do people actually define themselves as a term? I think even goths, you know, the bands alone don't find themselves goths and think it's like uh, everyone I knew who's properly into punk. Not, I mean, a lot of them say I'm punk for life and all that, but really, the relation, I like that relationship when, you, when you're into a culture, but you're not part of the culture, you're slightly detached from it. Yeah. So you kind of you kind of rebel against your own culture, which, because it's, it's an, because it really, it's a collection of individuals, isn't it? It's not, it's not really a tribe at all, is it? So your definition is, it will be different from mine and it should be, you I know. Really and you won't think I've got to listen to this because I'm goth. You probably like a lot of music that isn't goth as well, or you, you know. And I think but there are certain things that you would like that cross over into gothy things, like like black. Black is such a great colour, isn't it? I mean, nearly everything I own is black because yeah. of, I like black things before goth existed. When I was about ten, yeah. I liked stuff that was black just because because I like I like the way. In fact, the way what how you define black as a colour is how you define goth because black is is not a colour, but it's all colours mixed together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Even back in the day, I mean, people, I, I was wearing black, and, and people would say, "Why are you wearing black?" But now everybody's wearing black. I <laughs> know oh, that's the other thing, isn't it? It's it funny, doesn't yeah. stand out anymore because it becomes everywhere. It's like years ago, having a Mohican or Mohawk would get you beaten up going around town, and now, now you watch uh, football, and all the footballers have that haircut, you know. Whereas they would never have a haircut like that when I was a kid. They all had like ferns, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, so yeah. It, beco it becomes so mainstream, it almost becomes invisible. But, on, but on, on the other hand, you know, I always think that anybody's into a quite intense culture, you can always spot the people a mile off. It's like you can always spot punk bank managers. You know, they have a suit on, they look like a bank manager. Uh -huh. But uh, you look at their eyes and you know it, you feel it. <laughs> they roll up the sleeves and the tattoos are there. It's still, the vibe is still there. You, you just instinctively know. But somebody's uh, got a, a more intense, deep, yeah. uh, deep dive into culture, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You just, you, you you recognize somebody who's got who's into the dark music, and you can you can just feel it, right? I know what you mean. Yeah, just somebody's got that cultural yeah. intensity. I, I like those people. They're the fascinating people. But it, it doesn't even have to play out music. It could be somebody who's passionate about anything. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Or good things, not bad things. <laughs> Yeah, it's just yeah. I I think I think the they have a lot of Scorpio energy in them, you know. I think in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, you, you just feel it. You sense it. You instinctively feel it, don't you? You feel a commonality with them, so you can talk to them even if they're into a culture you're not necessarily into. But the way they're into that culture, you have an understanding of. Because obviously, it's better if you find somebody who can who knows you know uh, who can go through all Noy I suppose and the Noy Barton's albums in a one hour conversation. <laughs> Um, do you know if there is a? I know there's probably a lot of music that that you know. If you were to pick a song that best represents uh, the most popular, I guess, by the 
by but by goth the goth culture subculture what would that be you think if there was a one, the one I would pick is that Bella Lugosi's dead. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. <laughs> because I think even though they didn't really mean to do it, they, they didn't, and that is the first kind of, it's the first record that kind of threads together all the different narratives mm-hmm. and makes what most people understand as being the first goth record, even though there's ones before yeah. all groups working in that area. Uh, it's about the dance floor. You could dance to it, which is very mm-hmm. goth. Because if people have this idea that goths are just morose people, uh, wallflowers in clubs. No, the clubs are full of people dancing. Yeah. Um, and it ha- you had to be able to dance music. And that's why there's a massive club called to see the punk, uh, which we went just before. There's live gigs. There was no, there's hardly any punk clubs. You, could, you wouldn't go for a night out in a punk club. It hardly existed. There's a few, but not many. But yeah. with the golf clubs, like I said before, every town had a golf or a turn to club. And for a golf band to, be, to get quite big, most of them, you had to be able to dance to them. And Bella Gozzi, because he has that four 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 in the, in the kick drum, yeah, it's perfectly yeah. danceable, but also it has a space in it, you know, it has which it's very important to golf, you know. And I think Joy Division with Martin Hannett's production has kind of toyed with this. The idea rock music didn't have to be claustrophobic and dense like it had been with punk, it's very dense. Everybody's playing all at once. It's what you don't play. It's a lot of golf records, actually have a lot of space in it. So the, so the sonic architecture of the Bella Goes is dead. It's, it's yeah. really sparse. Yeah, expression. And yeah. Yeah, you could dance to it. And also it's uh, that, that interesting sort of juxtaposition of very melancholic you know, vibe. It's kind of got a dark humor as well. It's kind of funny. Uh, and also it's got, it's got a lot of black music influence in there with the dub, with the disco. And other bands, and, and Bauhaus themselves later on will play around with funk as well, you know. Because it's about the dance floor, so it's, a lot of people think it's, it's, a lot of people say, oh, isn't that the whitest music ever? And they don't actually know. It's cross-pollinated with loads of black music, you know, and it's, it's not just straight white rock music. It's, it's about technology, the dance floor, uh, different moves, different, very subtle, textured, and also um, very literate as well. Bella Goes is Dead. It's, it's a great lyric. It's kind of, it's a minimal lyric, but it's a very literate lyric. Somebody very smart had to write that lyric. Yeah. And then it's, and there's glam in there as well because Peter Murphy does does do a great David Bowie. He updates Bowie. Yeah, and, and the movie. The, I think of the movie The Hunger and with David Bowie and and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a perfect marriage, isn't it? It's like the yeah. disciple meeting the master. I mean, I, I love. I mean, I love Bauhaus. You know, amazing bands. And it's, when they reformed a couple of years ago, it was great seeing them play Ali Pali in London. It was such a perfect venue for it. And it, but you, we all knew it wasn't going to last, didn't we? You know. <laughs> At some point, the wheels are going to come off. I'm amazed they kept that going for two years, really. But you know, the plus is we got Love and Rockets back, haven't we? Which, which in England, oh, yeah, yeah. We never, we've hardly ever seen them. They, they, they didn't do anything in England. They, they weren't that known here. But in America, they had a top five hit. Which people in England, when I tell them that, they, they look at me like I'm mad. I go, no, Love and Rockets are huge <laughs> in America. Because, because in England, I don't think they sold hardly any records. I, 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 I emailed Daniel Ash. Couple of days ago, and I said, Oh, it's brilliant. You've done Love and Rockets. You've got to get it over here because I've never seen you play. And he goes, No one likes us over there. And I was going, I'm going to have to, I'm going to twist the promoter's arm to get them over just so I could go and see him. <laughs> yeah, you know, Love and Rockets played here in Hawaii in the 90s. See, see, this is annoying when you play it because they hardly play Britain, <laughs> but they play Hawaii. But I don't blame them for playing Hawaii. <laughs> and they all, live in, they all live in LA, so really, they're an American band now. Although they do sound, in all those years they've lived in LA, they still sound very British. You yeah. know, so if, if they did make another record, it would sound like a British record. I mean, most of the Rockets records were recorded in England in the same studios as uh, the Bauhaus records. I mean, that is not the other amazing thing about Bella. They, their first rehearsal, they wrote it in their first rehearsal, and four weeks later they recorded it as a demo, and that's the version. I mean, who else writes a timeless classic in four weeks? Informing, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, another um, it, what's interesting about your book is you 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 mentioned these things and it, I, it brings back so many the sisters of mercy. You know, they have a song called Emma, which is actually from a disco as a cover of uh, the you know, the hot hot chocolate, chocolate song, which is really uh, I mean, that that's such a dark song. I mean, it really, is it's a dark, very dark. I mean, they covered that because they were sick of, that's their first complaint against goth because people said you're humorless. And actually, there's a lot of humour in the sisters. Um, but also, they were saying there's other songs that are darker, and Emma's a much darker song, and here's our cover of it. And also, it's a nod to, to their, it's their nod to disco as well, because everything the sisters do, there is a sort of, because of the drum machine, it's dance floor, isn't it? 
And I think Floor Show by Sisters is one of my favourite golf songs, inverted commas, as well, you know, because it's a song about dancing in a club, because Eldritch used to DJ in the phono leads before he's in the Sisters, and, and he's, he's part of the time, Claire Shearsby, he was the main DJ in there, and she was a person in Leeds who was turning everybody on to suicide, Stooges and all those groups who were quite obscure in England. You know, Stooges in the late 70s, early 80s were, were kind of a footnote. You know, Iggy was known because David Bowen talked about it in Leeds. They, they were part of the culture because she played the records loads. So you get that weird cross between the Stooges and suicide, which is kind of a lead scene, isn't it? But with that nod to disco as well, you know, which I mean, don't know records sound amazing. You listen to Sisters records now, they still sound like the future, don't they? They don't date because, again, they're very sparse. And the production on is so fantastic. And I, I, th- I mean, Eldridge, again, like probably like Nick Cave, but he works hard at his music. It's, every detail is really covered. I mean, this tells you everything you need to know about the Sisters. They had the t shirt design before they even wrote a song. <laughs> <laughs> the <true>. logo, <coughs> the amazing logo, because that's what it's, what it's like. He's very, uh, he's very visual, visually orientated artist, Andrew Eldridge. You know, the songs are visual, aren't they? You know. Yeah. You know, and, and another thing, I I I love your book because you 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 mentioned these these, thing, you know these these artists, uh, Hans Belmer. Now I didn't know this about Adam Ant. Appreciating that artist, Hans Belmer. I mean, is is he does a, a lot of uh, just you know really um graphic uh, that the work itself. You know, I. Yeah, it's it's very art school a lot of it. I mean, some of the people like Adam went to art school. Some of the people didn't go to art school, but they, they were very. Uh, the Bauhaus was formed in an art school. It was, it was an art school in Northampton, so it wasn't that hardcore. But David J and Daniel Ash, they met at an art school, didn't they? Because they're the only two pupils or well, students in the art school who had drain pipes on, and everyone else had flares. So they, they were kind of getting on the punk thing where everyone else was still like a hippie. So they kind of, um, that's how they kind of met. And the, and the whole thing was couched, for them, it was couched at art school kind of thing. But even if people didn't go to art school, had an art school attitude to what they were doing, I think that's quite important in Goth as well, isn't it? Because in fact, someone said to me, Goth read a lot, and it's true, isn't it? It's a culture about books, and it's, it's, there's an instinctiveness in there, but it's also thought out and worked out because it's, it's a complex, nuanced, textured culture, musically and visually as well. Yeah, and then uh, the other artist that you mentioned, um, um, which I really like as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is a great book. If if now your book is available, your your book is available on your um, on the Bandcamp page, right? Yeah, it is now. Then it comes out uh, about two months. Then probably in America proper just after that as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's available on Bandcamp if, some, if somebody wants to check out your book. It will, it will be released in March, but they can order it now. Yeah, Pre- yeah, the signed copy, pre order, yeah. Yeah, was it be yeah. a signed copy? Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to take a lot of signing. It's going to take me a week to sign the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not complaining, though. That's a good thing. Yeah. Are you, are you going to include like a, like, a, like a music section for your book eventually down the road, maybe? Oh, to put it in then? Uh, no, I think. It's all in there. You can't get any more. There's so many pages in it. We only just got everything in there before the price started rocketing up. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've gone through two publishers to get this thing out because the other yeah, publishers yeah. want me to make cut half the book out. They didn't want the pre uh, seventy nine stuff. They wanted it all taken out. And I was going, we can't have a goth book without Lord Byron. You can't have a goth book uh, referencing romantic poets or decadent poets or you know graveyard poets it all has to be in there because it makes sense when you see it all but they were interested in that part but i'm fascinated by that part i think you know if you you make a deep dive into a culture and all the rabbit holes they're the fascinating bits aren't they everyone knows the story of the stories but you put it into a bigger context it becomes fascinating yeah i i I just um you reference uh the the pre-raphaelites in there which i totally agree that's a it's very important. Got the got culture influenced by the pre-Raphaelites, and uh, you mentioned uh, the sorrows of young weather, which is one of my favorite books by Goethe. Yeah, uh, which is which is great. I mean, I mean, it's just and then Federico Garcia Lorca is mentioned in there. Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm not say, I'm not saying that um, everybody in every goth band sat down and did that reading list, but that culture was it's definitely yeah. framing the culture, you know, and it's. And also a lot of the um, 
the ideas that people are grappling with in, in, in that kind of Gothic period have been dealt with before, but in the 19th century kind of film. So, you know, it's it's a book and it's got a different angle because it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a pre-technical, yeah. pre-technological age, isn't it? You know, yeah, there's one of the, uh, Nick Cave loves uh, Federico Garcia Lorca as well. And uh, yeah, it's, it's so wonderful. I, I just love how you you covered uh, the art of darkness has so much information. I mean, it, we would have to do an interview again to talk about everything in here. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing <laughs> book. I appreciate you coming on and talking a little bit about it. Now, you know, I, I know you're also with, um, you know, with your band. So I know you just toured with the Membranes. Yeah, we just got back. Uh, we were out with the Chameleons in the UK now. In Europe, the Stranglers just before that. Yes, yeah, so we talked quite a lot of people. The tour before that, before the pandemic, we were out with Mark Lanigan. So that, that was a great tour. I mean, Mark, shame Mark, I mean, it's sad that Mark died because he's a friend of ours. But yeah. Mark would have been a great interview. The book, he did give me a couple of quotes. But well, I was going to interview him for the book because he likked all this music. I mean, oh, yeah. people have Mark tagged into the grunge thing, but Mark's fascination with British post punk. I mean, when we toured with him, he couldn't believe that we were touring with him. And I go, well, we're just a nothing little band, you know. But but to him, it was like, you know, when the Stones got Howling Wolf out on their first uh, American TV appearance, and Howling Wolf stood there looking completely like, just playing in bars to Ted Pink, really. And suddenly he's on national TV in America, and the Stones are all stood around and go, we're still next to God. And Howling Wolf's going, I'm just a blues guy. You know, and it's... And, to, and in a weird way, Mark's like that British post punk, and he, he really was into the minutia of it. And he was a massive Sisters fan, uh, all those groups. You know, that that's actually where he's coming from. And he would drive. He told me he drove five hours from the little town he was in America to Seattle to buy a record. He had a Joy Division cassette. He's the only kid in his whole town that had the Joy Division cassette. And he sit in his car driving around the town playing it because that was his cassette recorder. <laughs> And I, I know you, you're, you're also part of, a, you launched this on ra- online rock music magazine called Louder Than More. Yeah, so it's mainly a website. We did do a print edition, but we, we were knackered by the uh, pandemic because every issue we sold will pay for the next one. But when all the shops are shut for the pandemic, we couldn't afford to make a next one. But at some point, I'm going to do, a, a, do it twice a year, like, yeah, like a biannual version of it. Because a lot of people like print media, whereas I, weirdly, I don't even read print media now. I, I do everything online. Mm-hmm. I even read books online. I mean, I think it's such an amazing thing. You know, when you, when you grew up in my time, you used, you used to get a train to London with about 50 magazines in your bag. <laughs> and now I can read them all on the phone. Which, which, so the information overload, I completely love it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know one of the, I know you also do interviews. Uh, is there a particular? Is there if there was one 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 artist you would want to interview that you haven't yet? Who would that be? Um, do you know who I really like to interview? I really like to interview Grimes. I think she's fascinating. I've read her interviews and she's so out there. So, and she talks about sci-fi, medieval history, um, just just amazing concepts. You know, she, she reminds me of David Bowie a lot. You know where. He wouldn't just talk about the new album. He'd go off on lots and lots of tangents. And I love those conversations where people go off off topic, you know, because they're interested more. I mean, I, I love music. and I, it's on, I think about it all day long. Yeah. But, I don't, I, but I'm fascinated with lots of other stuff as well. And when you go in, uh, when I read her interviews, there's a great one of Vanity Fair, of all magazines. I thought, God, she's fascinating, you know. But I do like her records. And also I can hear... Uh, and industrial music and rock influence in her pop music as well. And uh, when you read all her interviews, you find out that when she was a kid, she was into that kind of stuff, you know, Nine Inch Nails and whatever. But she had a knack of turning it into this kind of quite a, kind of pop music, but quite off kilter pop music. And I think her Instagram feed is great as well. The way she looks completely bizarre is fantastic, you know. She's like a proper old school. But the pop stars I grew up in the glam period look weird, you know, and I love that the way David Bowie. Was, was quite shocking in a, in a brilliant way. I mean, nobody had spiky hair, but let alone shave their eyebrows off. <laughs> I mean, like that. It looked like an alien. And I did come from that time where most people who made music did look like aliens. You know, we thought they were from outer space, which, which is so that all those things feed in there. And it's quite hard to do now because, like we said before, everybody's got used to everything. But every now and then, somebody does turn up and you could twist it a little bit further. So I think she'd be interested. And obviously, for loads of people, you know, but. She would definitely fascinate. I think Susie would be interested as well. I mean, I've met Susie, but never interviewed her. She's actually really funny. 
Yeah, they're, they're, they're actually going to tour pretty soon again, right? Yeah, everyone's really excited about that, aren't they? You know, I, know, I read about that. I saw her in a, in San Francisco. Uh, on the solo tour. The last time. The latest, the last time she did that, her single, you know, her 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 uh, side project with her by herself. Yeah. yeah that I was... saw that tour. It was great. Really great, yeah. wasn't it? I, I, love, I love the album. That's, I like cause Yeah, me I too. I like a lot of that kind of industrial music. You know, well, I mean, when I think of industrial music, I still think of Flobbing Gristle and 30 Cabs. But industrial kind of means nine inch nails. It kind of, kind of rock industrial, isn't it? I suppose you call it. And she was doing that, wasn't she? So it was. It was kind of half person, half human, half machine music. Yeah. Now, you were the first journalist to interview Nirvana. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, but not not because I thought they're going to be massive, but because uh, it was a cassette of uh, Love Buzz in, in the sounds uh, office before they even put a record out. Mm -hmm. And nobody's really a plot on the but I played it. I thought, oh my God, this is our voice. It's amazing. It's so captivating. I, I just rang him up at his mum's house because he was still living with his mother then. I still got the phone number. I might be nuts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so she's still living there. But um, so it, it was just a, a new band interview. I, didn't, I knew nothing about them. We didn't have a press release. It wasn't like I could Google them in uh, 1988 or whatever it was. I think it was 88. It was just, uh, it was just a, so who are you? Where are you from? <laughs> That's one of those interviews. And then about six months later, I went to uh, interview them in New York uh, when they were doing their first tour. And we stayed with him in a flat for four days. It was Janet Dulling's flat, who's now the uh, deputy head of Warner Records, isn't she? But she was, uh, she knew some pop people, so she used to put the bands up in her uh, flat in Avenue B, when it was like a war zone, Avenue B. There was like crack dealers and all the steps. It was just, an, it was, I went down there a few years, about four years ago, and it's, it's like a million pound flats now, but then it was just this mad place. So we, and um, so it was Austin Town in Nirvana, just sleeping this tiny flat old line back to back on the floor. And I found the interview actually, found the cassette of it. It's, it's quite haunting when you listen back to it. I can remember it all. And also they, they talk about, you know, the intensity you have to have to get to the music they make. And you think in the context of what happened in the end, it's actually got a different slant on it. You think maybe you shouldn't have, it's a shame you had to be that intense, you know. But it's, uh, and they talk about this, and I'm not sure if it's Team Spirit, but they say, we've got this new song. They start describing it. It's really hard to work out what it is. Is it the first mention of Team Spirit? Did they write it that early? Was it, it was sat there for a year and a half. You know, and I saw them play. I saw them play in uh, Maxwell's in Hoboken to 20 people. The gig's on YouTube because I remember somebody filming it with a little tripod camera. Yeah. And I'm thinking, why, why are they filming this? There's, there's like this, this band's totally obscure. Because I liked a lot, by mistake, I liked a lot of bands that are obscure. Yeah, I just yeah. thought they're just another one of those bands that only I'd ever like. And then about I don't know, a year later, they're the biggest band in the world. I mean, it really was mm -hmm. a bang like that one. It was no yeah, yeah. curve going up. I mean, God, it must be so hard to cope with. I mean, obviously it was, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, so, Lanigan, told, Mark Lanigan told me he went to Kurt's house the day oh. Kurt shot himself, didn't he? Oh, wow. Yeah, and he's, knocking on, he's knocking on the door all morning to, to go around and see him. And then he'd go, oh, fuck it, I'm going back. And he went back to where he lived. And that's the day that Kurt shot himself and he's really regretted well, he said, I should have broken in, you know, but I think, well, you can't really break in. You might, you might have just been dozing off in the city, you know. <laughs> oh, that's Because they, they, they were best mates, weren't they? Um, yeah. Lanigan, Kurt Cobain, and the guy out of Earth all shared this mad, you know, a couple of years before that, they shared a flat in Seattle, didn't they, where they all got into really mad drugs and dressed in wedding dresses and did loads of crazy stuff. And it was Kurt, and that's where they all got into the blues and they got into... Uh, in the Pines, that was their favourite song, which Nirvana did this amazing version of an acoustic album. But Lanigan, what you hear his music in the end, he sounds like blues, doesn't he? He's got a blues thing, you know, and the blues voice. And it all came out that flat on earth now, then it was left alive. And he makes this really, I don't know, you must, do you know Earth at all? Yeah. This, this, this amazing band, really dark, yeah. minimalistic, spectral blues. I love Earth. And, it was, and I loved them, but when I went to uh, Washington State, I totally got it because it was really rainy. It rained non-stop, these big fir pines everywhere. And all we did on that tour, driving through Washington, was play Earth non-stop, because it, they're the soundtrack to, to that kind of corner of America, which is my favourite corner of America, because it's so, it reminds me of being here, because <laughs> it's, it's, it rains non-stop. <laughs> wow, so much information. So um, with your band, is there, a, is there a place that you would like to, um, would like to, like to play with, with uh, the, the membranes? Would you like to go I mean, I like play never. We have played a lot of places. We played we played Russia before the war. You can say that now. It's kind of, uh, 
played there a, few, a couple of times and then played all over Europe, played America. And I like to go back to America, but it's so hard to get into now oh, because the, okay. vi- the visas cost a British band five, six, seven thousand pounds to oh, be allowed wow. into America to play. And if we go without a visa, if they catch us on Google, the gigs, we get banned for life. It's just oh, insane. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but yeah. America bands can come and play in England and the visas cost 50 pounds. I don't understand how that, that could be a thing. So an American band can come in England for its holidays and tour. For us, it's like a bankruptcy. <laughs> yeah. I guess you have to set up a tour and then just do it one time and just go all over the place. Yeah, yeah but they might not let you in. You see, sometimes when you get to the uh, customs uh-huh. now, you do your passports, you have a laptop and they Google your name. They, they Google me four years ago to South by Southwest, and I wasn't touring. I was just going as a writer. And they actually Googled my name, and they said, you're in a band. They go, yeah. And so you playing? They said, no. And they're looking for the gigs, so you can't advertise your gigs online because they'll find them oh. if they randomly check you. So it's and I yeah. think, why? Why should I feel like a criminal? I'm not. I mean, yeah. I'm not. I'm not going into America taking millions of dollars out. I've been looking to take one dollar out, <laughs> and, it, and it annoys me because I love American culture. I love American people. You know, we're, we're all this culture that we're all talking about. We share this culture. It goes beyond national boundaries. It belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong to the American government. It doesn't belong to the British government. It's ours. <laughs> it's mine. It's yours. It's the people listening to this podcast, isn't it? It's, it transcends all that petty international bullshit, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, that's very true. Well, you know, well, thank you so much for this wonderful interview. I mean, there's so many uh, just wonderful things about your book, and I'm sure... Many people will enjoy reading it. Um, I can't wait for the actual book to come out and my, my signed copy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, and, uh, they're all besides. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Well, it's about 1,500 to sign at the moment. So. <laughs> so congratulations on your book. I'm looking forward to big shout out to Nicholas Clift of uh, Definitive Gaze. Uh, and also, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Nick's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, the book you can find it again on um on your on the Bandcamp on uh the membrane um, Camp page, right? Yeah, if you Google membranes Bandcamp Art of Darkness, it'll probably take you to the link. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you so much. Let me rec- let me thank you for doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Let me stop the recording here.